I'm going to talk to you about a, an idea that has been brewing for me for uh, several years now. It all started with uh, a car ride that I took with Corey Haynes. Do you guys know who Corey Haynes is by chance? No? Okay. So Corey Haynes is a hippie. Uh, in the, no, he is. He is. He's an ex-hippie. Uh, he's a really great Ruby programmer. He did this, this uh, code retreat thing. Have you done code retreat here yet? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. I'm really just asking you questions to make sure you're awake. I wasn't satisfied with your response to Jan and PJ. Um, so, good morning. One more time, please. Good morning. How American of me, sorry. Uh, so Corey and I were on this drive. And we were trying to figure out what I should talk about at some conference that I was, I was invited to. And, and we decided, we got, we got lost. This is why it happened. We got lost going from Boulder, Colorado to Longmont, Colorado, which is literally a 10-minute bike ride. But somehow we were in a car and we got lost for an hour and a half. Uh, this is why I don't drive anymore. But we came up with the idea that someone should talk about how legacy, the word legacy as in legacy code, has gotten a bad name and shouldn't have gotten a bad name. Please come in. It's no problem. We're very informal here. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, all right, cool, thanks. Was that you? Yeah. Damn you. OK. So uh, I've been, I've been like, thinking about this and trying to work it into my work for a long time. Like, How do we build code that can last for a long time? Because outside of the software industry, the word legacy is not a negative word, right? It's a good word. You leave a legacy for someone. So anyway, it's only 30 minutes. I've got like three hours of material here, so I'm going to go really quickly. First thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, I want to turn on my little thingy here. I'm such an amateur. It's amazing. Um, I wanted to tell you that you all suck. You're really bad at what you do, and so am I. Um, this is the Standish Chaos Report kind of glossed over, you don't care about the numbers exactly. The Standish Chaos Report reports on software project success. Uh, the green ones are the ones, the green bar at the bottom is successful projects over some period of years. The red are completely failed, like canceled projects. The stuff in the middle is projects that are significantly over time or over budget, which in my world is also somewhat of a failure. So you can see that we really, really suck at actually delivering software. The chances that you finish a project successfully are very low. And for business software that gets deployed, if it actually makes it to production, the typical lifespan in my career that I've seen is about five years. And yes, I made this up. I couldn't find any kind of evidence that this is true. But five years is about right. When you build a, a business app, someone's going to be replacing it as legacy code. So you're barely able to actually get something deployed. When you do, it's not going to live very long. This is a pretty miserable career that we have here. We're not really building anything of value, anything that lasts for any, any period of time. It's amazing. So the word legacy, we can't leave a legacy. Most of us. Most of us will not. When we die, people will look back at our careers and say, well, they worked on computers, these old things that people used to use, and no one uses what they did anymore. Maybe they, they changed the way we thought about the thing so that someone else could come along and write something that no one else uses now because you know, all that software is dead, the computers are dead, etc. So how do we build a legacy, a real legacy from the work that we create in software? Uh, the problem is when we create code that actually goes into production, it becomes the bad version of legacy code very often. So code is very hard to change. I think you've all probably touched legacy code that's hard to change. Am I right? Yes? OK, good. So in Israel, you also have bad legacy code. I'm learning a lot. And we create these huge, tightly coupled systems, these nasty, huge, tightly coupled systems. Um, unfortunately, this is the default setting. So when I say default setting, I mean as software developers, as software teams, the default thing that we are going to do is create these big, nasty monoliths that are tightly coupled. Even when we're trying not to, that's just like if we set out as a team to make beautiful code, to make a wonderful software project, odds are we're going to create something that doesn't stand the test of time, that is going to die, and that is going to die a slow, painful death with people hating it in the process. And that's the sad thing about legacy code. Not only does it die in five years, but it dies with people like throwing rocks at it and spitting on it. because. And, and hating it, just like you hate those legacy systems right now at work. So this is a pre pretty sad state of affairs. Um, 
We have test suites for the code, but they're slow and brittle. It's just a pain. Like how many of you have a test suite that takes too long to run and you've spent time working on it? Probably someone here, yes. Uh, I know we have, like we've had whole projects in, in, like consulting projects that I've done in the past that are about speeding up test suites for people. That's ridiculous, what a waste of time. There's no value in a test suite. There's no inherent business value in a test suite. Uh, here's the worst one. Um, early in my career, we had a, I was at GE, we had these big Java, like business to business applications. Once a week we would do a deployment and every week, the, the team would plan to stay up all night. And when I say the team, I, I mean like 30 people across three continents would plan to stay up all night. And what we would do is like literally replace class files and then like restart and hope it restarted. Things are not that bad these days in most cases, though they probably are in some cases. But deployment is still scary. You deploy and you kind of don't know what's gonna happen in these, in these big coupled nasty systems. And not only that, like that's just deploying your own software. What about upgrading Rails? Or I'm assuming you're using Rails, am I right? Who's, who's using Rails? Okay, good, you're in the right conference. If you're not using Rails, who wants to? No, no one, okay. Good choice also. So it's terrifying. Like uh, uh, in my last job, we were on a, an, an ancient version of Rails, two something, and you know now it's four. And I remember like early when I got there, one of the team members put a pull request in just to upgrade to a, like a major or a minor, minor, or a tiny version bump. And everyone was like, no, no way, ever. And literally we never upgraded it. Instead, if there was a security patch, we just made the patch. Like it was really terrible. You never knew what you had. And therefore, like Rails 3 came along, it had all this great stuff that we could have used and now Rails 4 is out and we end up having to recreate this stuff in the nasty old legacy framework we're using. We're using Ruby 1.8 and now it's 2.0, like we whole, totally missed the 1.9 thing. But this is because we're afraid to change our systems. And being afraid to change stuff as a software developer might be the worst thing that you can experience. It is for me. And we're afraid to change it because like, we can't even find where stuff is. And why is this? Because we build these big messy systems, these big monoliths, and then we build all these abstractions on top of it. So you've got so many abstractions, you have to learn the language of the system just so you can navigate it to find like how to, change, how to upcase a name that displays on a screen somewhere. And we just bury things in abstraction, but it's because we're trying to do things right. It's not because we're messy and sloppy and lazy and terrible. We suck because we care. So there are, not all systems are like this though in the world. So for example, you can still drive cars like this. Old cars, they still work. Like much older than me even, you can drive them around. That's much older than five years old. And they still survive. So why is it? The other thing that survives, which really shouldn't, like if you look at how I've treated myself, it's a miracle that I'm still alive. Uh, I don't even do any maintenance on myself. And somehow I'm still alive, I'm almost 40 years old. So uh, how does this work? Well, I think if we, if we look at how, how bodies work, human bodies, we might gain some insight. So the human body stays regulated through this process called homeostasis. And don't worry, I won't explain it to you because I don't really understand it, frankly, um, because I'm completely uninterested in science, I have to admit. Someone asked me if I was a computer scientist uh, earlier, and I was like, no, not, not even close. Um, but homeostasis, the idea is that the body has these systems that regulate itself. So there are parts of your body that do things that are harmful to you. Basically everything in your body does something that's harmful. Then other parts of your body counteract those effects. So for example, your brain is like the control agent and then you have uh, a liver that metabolizes things that you shouldn't be putting in or even things that you should be putting in. Your kidney does sort of things and it's this balanced system that results in you surviving even though you abuse yourself, just like I do. So that's homeostasis. And uh, if, if you can't maintain homeostasis, you can go into a, a state called homeostatic imbalance. And this will result in se severe sickness or death. Now, the good news about this is you're already dying. 
They're all dying right now. Five trillion cells in your body, or 50 trillion cells in your body, three million die per second. And I say this is a guess, this isn't my guess because I would have no grounds on which to, to base my guess, but this is a guess of scientists who actually know. So you're sitting here, like it's kind of a cliche that you've heard all your lives, or at least you know, up at, at a certain age, that you aren't the same person physically that you were some years ago because you're literally being replaced. And it, it's really deep, you know, you think like I'm, I'm physically not even the same entity, but somehow I have memories and such. It's actually true though, They're, like the parts of your body are disappearing and being replaced all the time. But this kind of makes sense, like if you think again to software, if you could replace all the parts of the software all the time, maybe the software as a whole could live. So maybe this is the solution to how to create long lasting legacy software, to build things the same way that human bodies are built, or that cars, like I didn't talk about cars much, but the car can still go, because probably most of the car that's 100 years old is not actually the same car anymore. Just like your body is not the same as when you were born, different cells. So as an aside, I will say that keeping things small wherever possible is universally a good thing to do. And that's really a non sequitur. All right, moving on. So, if you're going to, to take this idea, you have to say, okay, in software then, what is a cell? And I would say that a cell is the tiniest component that you can think of. That's what a cell in a software system is. And these are the things that are gonna be replaced, right? The title of my talk is Disposable Components. Uh, and then what is a system? Well, we have a pretty good idea of what a system is in a software system. Uh, a while back I, I did this. This is how I actually do my research for presentations. I just ask questions on Twitter and people answer and I put them on a slide. So I asked, what are the oldest surviving software systems you regularly use? For example, GNU, Linux, what else? And I got this. So you can see these. You probably recognize most of these, if not all of them. But what you can see here is that uh, I said the word system is kind of overloaded, and I got a combination of systems and not systems, and I guess I didn't actually include all of them on here, but like, grep is more like a component. That's kind of the Unix philosophy of doing tiny little things, you know, one, a tool just does one thing, does it well, and that's it, gets out of the way, and then they're loosely joined. Um, but then there are a bunch of these other things like Emacs and BSD, C language tool chain X windows. The interesting thing here is if you look at the design of any of these systems that you can say have lived for a long time that you know about, they really are systems that like little bits and pieces have been replaced and they can be replaced safely without destroying the integrity of the, the entire system, right? Like the Unix way is using standard in and out to communicate. So it's completely decoupled other than like, you know, protocols. So a personal um, example, when I was at GE in the late 90s, when I arrived, I found this thing that everyone called the bull. Um, maybe you have one here, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's not a very common thing, but it was a Honeywell bull mainframe system. But the interesting thing about this one is it, was, it had a custom TCP stack, custom RDBMS, custom, uh, really custom everything. It was maybe like a half customized operating system that GE appliances had create to run its backend systems. Like just a division of GE had, run, had created this thing. And I think when I got there, it was 30 years old almost. Yeah, almost 30 years old. And I asked recently, it's still in production, this thing. It's still in production because they couldn't find anything that was better. They tried, like we had a project 15 years ago called the Bull Exit Project. And we tried many times while I was there to replace bits and pieces, but no one was satisfied with the output because it wasn't as good as what the bull created. Now the interesting thing about the bull, it kind of shaped my thinking about software development at the time and probably going forward. Everything in the bull was done as a tiny replaceable program, a very tiny thing. And they were, and it was all consistent and well-documented so we could write code generators. So my first production Ruby code, in fact, in uh, the year 2000, generated Java interfaces to talk to the bull. And that might still be in production too. I heard recently that that was still there. So 
that's a 40-year-old system that they're still having trouble replacing. They don't even hate it, though. They're just afraid because the hardware might die. So, like, they don't have a choice now. They would rather stay on it. That's really cool. That is leaving a software legacy. So how do we build for something like this today? And by the way, I'm not sure if everyone will recognize, I hope you get the fact that this is ironic clip art. So you know, I, I, w I thought I was just going to leave it like that, and then I saw it come up and thought, what if they think I'm serious? Um, but how, how could you actually start a new system and build something like this? Well, this guy, Fred George, has uh, a talk you should watch. So I will avoid restating everything he said. I would say I agree. But if you look up uh, the Baruco conference, microservice architecture talk, Fred George talks a lot about his experience creating tiny little services. So the idea is that the services are like cells, which means they have to be really, really small. And when you do this, when you compose one big system of a bunch of tiny little systems, it changes the rules quite a bit. So I'm going to talk about the rules that I've created for my job, which is working on this thing called Wonderlist. Uh, a very brief overview of what it does, just so you understand what the problem is. Uh, it's a multi-platform productivity tool. So you can think like a, a to-do list, but it allows you as a user to share with others. And the reason that's important is that you're synchronizing to multiple devices, but you're also synchronizing to with multiple people. So you have conflict issues and that sort of thing. And you also have a lot of polling, so very high load on the system. And this is created initially as a basically a single backend REST API with a database behind it. And we've made some changes to it, and I'm going to sort of talk about that. The goals of the system are here. Here are my, my bullet points. You could read them. I'll just leave them there. No sense me doing it. But really, it's about being able to change, right? I want to be able to change things. I want to have fun. I want to go fast. I want to make the business better. These are the goals of these rules. So rule number one, comments are a design smell. How many of you read the comments first when the slide came up? OK, good. So I would bet that a lot of you don't disagree that comments are a design smell, especially in certain contexts. For example, this bottom one. Did someone interrupt? No? I think that was the echo of me somehow. Uh, especially the bottom one. Like if you have an inline comment, you usually find you're, just, you're basically documenting what should be a method with a good name, right? So I believe that comments usually are making up for methods that are too long, methods that aren't well, named well enough, classes that aren't named well enough, or abstractions that shouldn't be there because they're too confusing. And I would guess that most of you don't disagree very strongly. Now here's where it gets funny. Uh, you could remove all the comments as long as, like in this case, this class, it's stupid because I made up the names. But if you removed all the comments, it would be very clear what's going on. And for me, when I see all these comments, I can't even tell what the hell I'm looking at. I get really confused. So I will literally go into a file and immediately remove all the comments so I can see what the code does when I look at code. And you can see these, this is so short. Even though this is trivial and made up, if you remove the comments, it would actually be easier to tell what's happening, right? Because there's less noise in the way. Um, that's because the code is so short, it's just obvious. So here's the one you probably aren't going to agree with right off the bat. Tests are a design smell. Test or, or test are a design smell. <laughs> I'm from Arkansas in the US, and that's how we talk. Um, me and Bill Clinton. So test are a design smell. Uh, in my warped, my now warped view of the world, um, if your services are so small that you can read them in one go, you probably don't need a test. Maybe you do. So I'm not saying like a design smell doesn't mean don't do it. It just means if you see it, maybe it's a sign that you're covering up, uh, coming, uh, covering up another problem. And I think tests in our system, like that slow, brittle test suite I talked about earlier, are covering up a bit bigger problem, that our system is too complex. But if you were to take the system and decompose it into tiny, trivial pieces, then the trivial pieces could and should be so trivial that you don't need tests. Well, 
Good question. So would you write one acceptance test to test the whole goal because, the, because you get it, right? Probably, sure. Maybe I should say unit tests are a design smell, or unit tests is a design smell. Um, so another rule is, uh, and actually I'll go here first. The system is heterogeneous by default. And the reason this is important, uh, and literally, like, if you want to write it in Visual Basic, you can. Um, the reason this is important, this isn't just, like, part of it is, as a developer, you've all been in positions where you wish you could use some language and you can't. Because the tech lead won't let you. You're, the company's too conservative, whatever. I don't want the developers in our company to feel that way, and I don't want to feel that way. I want to be able to try something because I believe in it. I want to be able to work on the thing I'm passionate about, and I want everyone to work on the thing they're passionate about. Um, but there's actually a benefit to the system that goes with this. And the benefit to the system is, if you have Ruby and Python and Java, and let me add one more, Haskell, if you have those, then they cannot be tightly coupled without a whole lot of work. Like, you know, you can't run them in the same process, right? So by default, you're gonna have these boundaries that require you to come up with some other way of talking. This is good for the system, it's a good constraint. But the other constraint that I put on the developers is the code has to be this big. And I'm holding up my hand now in case you're looking at the screen. Literally, I say, if it's this big, you can write it in any language you want. Why? Because if it's this big, I can definitely understand it unless you worked really hard to make me not be able to understand it and then we'd all laugh and it would be funny anyway. If it's this big and it doesn't work when you're on vacation, then I can just rewrite it and deploy it in whatever language I want, right? Or it doesn't perform, I'll just replace it. So the idea is we can replace everything as long as it's trivial. And that gives us a lot of freedom and it removes a lot of fear. If the code is this big, even if it's that code up there, which we're gonna learn about later from Constantine, I'm not really afraid of that. Like I could spend an afternoon and understand what that does. And here's another very key point that maybe to some of you who do DevOps work is obvious, I don't know. For me, it's like a revelation uh, as I started getting into Amazon Web Services. The nodes, the actual servers are disposable. Uh, and by that I mean, and this is something we're still working toward, any server running in our infrastructure, and we have like 140, 150 servers right now running to make the back end of Wonderlist, any server I could just load up a console now and shut it down and everything would be okay. The worst case scenario is I shut it down and the load is too high because I just don't have enough nodes handling the load. But it's not that I shut it down and I lose something. Um, and the reason for that is every node is recreatable. And what I'm trying to get around here is the fear that you run into very often with systems, like I did system administration back at GE, I had servers that were running for over a year, nonstop uptime over a year. That's terrifying, like we were proud of it back then, but it's terrifying because you don't know what you did in the middle of the night or what your coworker did. You don't know that you can recreate that node from scratch if you have to. And the rule is you're gonna have to. Like, you know, every system is going to die and have to be restarted, or have to be replaced. So in our world, any node can be completely destroyed and recreated, uh, and you should not actually change anything on a node once it's booted. So the way we deploy, we have a bunch of tiny little services that could be written in any language a developer wants. When we deploy one, it's already running in production, for example, we actually boot up a new server, all automated obviously, install all the system software, all the framework software, the actual app code, start it, check it, see that it's working, shut it down, create an image that we can then instantiate n times. We instantiate it n times, like let's say 18 instances of this thing running, and then we just swap out what's in production with the new thing. So you never log in to a server and change anything on it. If you think about it, like the way that we have done system administration in the past, where we did log into servers and we changed things, imagine if the way that you deployed object-oriented code is you instantiated an object and it stayed alive for two years, and whenever you wanted to change something about it, you would go onto the server and set an instance variable. That's terrifying. 
but yet we do that with Unix uh, servers or with application servers. So you get to pick your technology. As I've said, everything is, is automated. The next step for us is after you deploy a system, we might even throw away the keys to it. Uh, and by that, I mean you can't log in. It's a Unix system, it's running, it's got your code on it, you deployed it, there's nothing you can do with it other than kill it, that's it. So that's a serious way of doing this. Uh, and if you're going to deploy something in a new technology, it has to be trivial. So you have to build into our framework the way we deploy things so that anyone can just launch it with a single command line. So the process I told you about of creating a new server, deploying everything to it, creating the image, launching it, et cetera, that's a trivial process with a single command line. <clears throat> uh, and then you're done. And then in this world, because change is hard, we're always deploying stuff, constantly deploying. All day, every day, there are deploys going. We have a hip chat uh, uh, chat room where everyone can see every time there's a new instance of a service deployed. And then you have to assume that things are gonna fail, which is something that we don't do very well as software developers. So, uh, I mean, the beautiful thing about this is we can monitor all the nodes. When they crash, we just start up new ones to replace them. Very simple because it's all automated and all instantiable. And as I said, we do monitor everything. Um, here is a key that Fred also talks about in his microservices architecture talk uh, that I agree with. If testing is a design smell, monitoring is the way that you overcome the limitations of that. So uh, we monitor everything. We have these massive graphs and dashboards. Um, and the idea is if we start deploying a new system, we can see when it causes problems. And we favor fixing resolution time over actually trying to stop failures from happening. So it's kind of like the Erlang way of thinking. Things are gonna crash no matter what you do, unless you're building the space shuttle or something like that, and then unfortunately that could crash too. But uh, you know things are gonna crash, so don't try to optimize for things not crashing. Just optimize for fixing them. That's what monitoring does. And it's not just monitoring stuff like RAM and disk and all the normal stuff. You can monitor business metrics. So here's something we developed when I was at Living Social called Rearview that allows you to do stuff like uh, aberration detection with machine learning over business metrics. So for example, the new user sign-up rate or login rate is changing over time and it's unusual. So you get an alert and you go check it out. And the other thing is, uh, the worst case scenario will happen to you. So my preference in these sorts of systems is to create it as soon as possible. So you create a system that can crash and you practice uh, resolving the issue. So this is an example from one of our graphs where we intentionally just started knocking out nodes from the main API until it couldn't handle it anymore just to see like what is that limit. Because no one dies when Wonderlist isn't available. So that's a good thing. Um, if you work on something that someone dies, if it's not available, then don't listen to anything I say. And I talked about this idea briefly, um, the canary in the coal mine style deployments. If you don't know what that means, it refers to a kind of sad practice from the coal mines in the United States where they would send canaries in and if they died, then probably things weren't okay for the miners. What this means in a deployment scenario is that uh, you slowly launch new instances and you can watch all your metrics and see how they change. So when I'm upgrading, you know, like doing something crazy with our user service, I can deploy it slowly, have some of the old ones, some of the new ones, and I can see, okay, this is not gonna be a good thing, so I roll it back to the old version. So these give us the assur assurance that we otherwise would probably have to lean on test for. So a couple of quick ideas. These are not actual rules. Um, and I don't have any real solutions here, but this idea of homeostatic balance that I was talking about, this is a very boring architecture that I got off of uh, Amazon, um, AWS Web Services, but if you look at it, you, know, you can see all these different layers in it. Each layer and each little line is potentially something that you could measure. And so, uh, you, know, you could think about homeostasis in a system like this, um, like you have Chaos Monkey from uh, Netflix, and you have, uh, which actually goes and just deletes servers and destroys servers to make sure the system can deal with it just randomly. And then you have the Pinterest way of doing things, which is they use Amazon spot instances, which actually only work up into a certain 
uh, and, until the market outbids you on the price of your servers, and then it just shuts them down without any warning. Um, so imagine that you had a system that could be resilient to this, and then you just adjust and, and match demand. Uh, I'll skip through a few things just to get to a very important point before I end. Um, Here's, a, here's something that I'm, I'm challenging my team to think about right now, and that, that's a way of me basically just saying I'm too lazy to do this myself and probably not smart enough. But imagine you had a routes file that could route to multiple backend services intelligently, and it looked like functional pattern matching, like an Erlang pattern matching syntax. So please, someone write this for me. But uh, I got this idea from uh, Reginald Braithwaite where he talks about Ruby's, like Ruby is basically a system created to make beautiful coupling, which is exactly not what I want. I want decoupling. So he talks about the idea of bind by contract. Imagine if you could apply the idea of bind by contract, meaning I want to call this web service, but only if it matches these requirements. If you could do that with services and not just methods. So imagine this was a route file definition. Kind of amazing, I think. So, jumping ahead, services in our system own and encapsulate their data. Uh, this is a very important point because it means that the databases are also very tiny. Um, the data should be as small as possible. So, you know, we have something that could very easily go in one database, but it's now, I don't know, 15 databases, and some of them are really trivial, and, and the more trivial, the better. Um, and finally, I will get to some problems with this approach because I, I told you I have three hours worth of material. So a system like this can end up being too slow. We have all these tiny little services. They have to be aggregated together to create uh, a whole. Um, Amazon does this, though. I heard even like five years ago that the front page of Amazon, it would be like 90 web service calls just to render one page. So it is possible to overcome it. We have overcome it in our case, but we have a special case because we're not rendering HTML. We're just doing services to clients so they can all run in parallel. Um, development is difficult in a scenario like this. I don't know a good solution to this. Hopefully you do. But one of them is develop in the cloud and automate the creation of a new entire ecosystem for every developer, which is actually pretty easy to do because our data is also disposable in this world. Um, there's no referential integrity between different parts of our data because our databases split across everything. Now the truth is there's probably no referential integrity in your rail system either. So yeah, no big deal, right? And this is maybe the hardest one, that you end up with no unified view of a system in the end. So it does get complicated. And that's when you start thinking like, well, maybe I need tests at the high level then. And Hmm, maybe I'm recreating the entire problem, but at a different level of abstraction. I don't know. I guess uh, time will tell. But you end up with the same basic problem that uh, Dijkstra complained about in his go-to considered harmful paper or letter. And that's it. Thank you very much.